USS LA Knight. Uh, yep. Something that I became aware of in doing my research very recently <laughs> called the Slash Fantasy, the Kirk Spock Slash Fantasy. And there's a phenomenal edited video on YouTube. Uh, the perspective of uh, gay people seeing that uh, is eye-opening. They see the gay passion, the gay attraction. I don't roll any rights to any of the thing. fucking documentary that's in the background, so you can suck things. my dick, YouTube. At my first convention in 1972, I walked into a hall so crowded, the thunderous wall of noise that greeted me took me completely by surprise. For several seconds, I literally could not speak because of the emotion. One of the things that I you know, really respect about um, your dad was, I guess, his love and affection for the fans and how he, how he, he always had time and energy, with the, you know, going to conventions and meeting people. And, you know, I'm blown away by how much love there is for it was an entirely new concept, this gathering of fans to celebrate Trek for a weekend. The organizers crossed Trek the fingers for a weekend. Trek, Trek for a weekend. Trek for a weekend. They got 3,000. We went to, we went to one uh, Star Trek convention, I think it was in LA. I'm not I sure. think you're right. Yeah. Uh, wild I remember concept. them having to get us out the back door. Right. Okay. What was that like? Wow. Uh, I think Star Trek fans have sort of pioneered the whole cosplay culture which now exists where you know, you go to any convention and people are dressed up as a multitude of things, from the most obscure to the most popular. I've been blown away going to now these conventions for a number of years, seeing what people are able and willing and, you know, what they commit to dress up as and do, and it's unbelievable. Mm-hmm. A lot of the shit that people fucking dress up as is fucking amazing, adorable, sometimes stupid, sometimes funny, sometimes shitty. Here we Anti planet oxygen nitrogen atmosphere. Sensors indicate no life forms. In all respects, quite ordinary, Captain. Mabe, I want you to tell me a little bit about your history with Star Trek, how it's affected your life. Uh, and I would say it's probably one of the biggest reasons why I've seen <laughs> yes. Star Trek, this, you know, this vision of the future. Um, it's one of the reasons why I work there today. Uh, seeing uh, a future where people, you know, from all different cultures and backgrounds were working together, you know, the betterment of humanity. I think that was a vision of the future that I wanted to, to help create. If Star Trek was the vision of the future that I wanted to create, Spock was the internalization of the kind of the person that I felt like I was, right? You know, as someone who was from two cultures, an you know, Iranian father, an American mother, um, I, I saw in Spock, you know, that's that same conflict, I guess, of, of which one am I? Am I both? Is there a, 
is there a happy medium of the two? Uh, but also at the same time, I, I saw that you know he was accepted uh, by by his you know colleagues. Spock stood for a lot of different things. He stood for intelligence, integrity. He stood for the idea of, of really searching for truth, for figuring out how things really work. That is the underpinning of science, really. So I think for a lot of people, Spock was a representative of, of science itself, of using the human mind to overcome kind of the forces of chaos I mean, and make sense of things. That really resonates with a lot of people here, I would say. It certainly did with me. And I knew the minute I read Star Trek books that that was the character I most wanted to emulate with my career. Spock was a scientist. Now, for me, I knew I liked science before Star Trek. So so Spock and I resonated, I think, uh, in a way that, that surely helped but didn't initiate my interest. But I wonder if the slow but real appreciation for what science is and why it matters that I see manifesting today, whether it owes its origin to that series, to that character. You're a Star Trek fan? How long have you been a fan? A hundred years Star Trek fan? Oh, you got the uh, bounce on a little bit. Uh, you had your own connection to Star Trek. Name? You've directed yeah, Star Trek episodes. Yeah, she's a trill. Yeah. But before that, I was... You're an entertainment attorney. What was that all about? What got you into that in the first place? You know, it's very difficult when you when you are the, the son of a celebrity and uh, somebody who becomes a pop culture icon to try to create your own identity, to find out who you are, in essence. And so this was my way of really creating my own path. He was very proud of the fact that I, I, I went to law school and I started practicing law. But after seven years of practicing, it became very clear to me that this was not something I wanted to do for the rest of my life. I didn't have the passion for it that um, I thought was important. That was really dad's whole philosophy was you have to have a passion for what you do. Otherwise, it's just work and it's not fulfilling. My dad was very sympathetic about my desire to make a career change and even helped me, train me uh, as a director. He and I actually made an, an episode of The Outer Limits together. We were remaking an episode that he was originally in in the early 60s, in which he had a supporting role. Design, your construction, nothing short of genius, but even you must understand that you're basically a takeoff on the thoughts and feelings that Dr. Link programmed into you. A man suffers, a man bleeds. Man has a soul. I could snap your neck as if it were a toothpick. In that sense, you're right. I'm not like most men. But like most men, I choose not to. Let me die. Let me die. The story of Star Trek, the motion picture, rightly begins in London, where my wife and I were vacationing in 1975. We were about to see Henry Fonda, who was performing on stage in Darrow. After the performance, we joined him and his wife for dinner. At some point during the conversation, Henry said, You know, Leonard, I hope you're being paid for all those billboards around town. What billboards, Henry? Do you mean to tell me you don't know about all those Heineken billboards? Now, I'd seen my Spock image used commercially before, such as on a box of Kellogg's cornflakes. I'd been amused by it, finding it campy and even flattering. Once Star Trek was canceled... Paramount had no legal right to license my likeness from that time on. So not only had Paramount been marketing me as Spock for almost ten years without the right to do so, for the last five of those ten... Yeah, that's why fucking uh, yeah, uh, Anton Paramount can't be in any of his ga uh, games that he... Uh... <laughs> so, like, uh, the game Star Trek Commander, uh, Commander on freaking... Uh, iPhone or playing on your PC, uh, you can't play him as a character because uh, his family won't uh, really allow his likeness to be uh, used anymore. I've just gone to work for Paramount, and I was acting in Equus on Broadway at the time in New York. So there goes little Jeffrey off trotting to New York <laughs> to say to him, you got to put the ears back on. So I, I went, I saw the show, and after the show, we went to Joe Allen's. I said to him, we're going to make the movie. Those ears are going on. They're either going on you, 
or they're actually going to go on somebody else, but they are going to go on. And how badly will you feel when you didn't put them on? The big leverage that we always had, beginning with these movies, was that Paramount Pictures needed him. And they couldn't make a Star Trek movie without him. Frank? Tap into BetMGM Casino, and you're entering a huge library full of exclusive games. Games you won't find anywhere else. Looking for jackpots? Price this way. You'll always find someone ready to give you a Or some dice. Oh, Your favorite game is waiting for you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did I put that back together right? <laughs> mm -hmm. I hope you did. Yeah. Otherwise, it kind of hurts. Finally, my lawyer calls. Look, Paramount's actually showing some willingness to reach an agreement. Would you read the script if they settle the lawsuit? Yes. Four days later, on a Friday evening, the lawsuit settled. My lawyer came to my house with a check. An hour later, the script arrived. I sat down and read it through that night. Leonard Nimoy was the last person to join the movie cast. He was asked why he was a holdout. I don't know there was a question of holdout. We had a, a long and complicated relationship, uh, I mean, Paramount and myself, for the last couple of years. And probably the thing that took the most time is the fact that the mail service between here and Balkan is still pretty slow. <laughs> <laughs> That's why everybody was like dispiriting, very depressing. They were going to use the other Vulcan that uh, was supposed to be uh, his science officer. But remember, they, uh, after he came, uh, decided to come back. They decided it's like, okay, we're killing him off. Yeah, we did our best, but I, I never. Uh, the pendulum swung completely when so the first he, uh, came along. They didn't kill him off. They just character and character oriented Star Trek. To an uh, pretty, uh, oh yeah, they and did the kill him. Was, well, we didn't have the money before. Now we got the money. We got to give him a big effect. He was so killed in a transporter the accident the with the other, uh, with another uh, uh, cadet. That's why they had to uh, bring uh, uh, Lieutenant Ilya as a new uh, uh, operary, operational helm officer. Nothing about the character. So it was frustrating and depressing, and uh, very painful. <laughs> You, God. you, I do not, uh, I do not recognize you, but you, Star Trek two. you, Mr. Chekhov, that part of Spanish is going to have the greatest death scene, Star Trek movie in my eyes, yeah. in most fucking Star Trek fans. A lot of people say that fucking generations never, or that, you know, not generations, that, the motion picture never, uh, really didn't happen. And when they said, yeah. you know, that's enough, why not? This is the end of Star Trek. Let's go out in the blaze of glory, saving the Enterprise. <laughs> Be a hero and die. <laughs> and always show me. Your friend. Prosper. Jim. And then, of course. Jim. He's already touched Dr. McCoy, and mm. he's in there. Yeah. Sooner than I realized, it was over. Oh. I stripped off the years, the makeup, the uniform, until Spock gradually disappeared, leaving behind only Leonard Nimoy. Never again, the raised eyebrow. Never again the delicious teasing of the irascible doctor or the offering of logic to my impetuous friend and captain. Never again the mind melt. Live long and prosper. I asked myself, what have I done? Well, of course, they, they put in a little footage at the end of the movie that suggested that, that, that this might not be the end of Spock. I'm sorry, Doctor, I have no time to discuss this logically. Remember. Remember. 
And they came to me, sure enough, after the picture opened and did business, and they called me in for a meeting. They said, we'd like to know if you'd like to be involved in another strip.